who's there? Come on in. Oh, hi, Laura. Hi, Professor. How are you? Good to see you. You must have gotten my card. I did. I invited you to come on in and look at some of the junk that we've accumulated over the years that the fire marshal says we have to get rid of now. As you know, last summer, the fire marshal came by to North Hennepin Community College and said, we got too much stuff here. It's a rat trap. And they suggested if we don't clean up, that, they're gonna, that we'll be forced to hire Marie Kondo and all of her entourage. And when she travels all the way from Japan with a round trip ticket, she carries a lot of baggage with her, just so you know. So we decided we would actually start cleaning up the art department. I've started to accumulate stuff and I realized that there's some interesting stuff here that Laura, you might be interested in uh, looking at before we dispose of it in a uh, secretive fashion, which will probably just go out in the trash. Awesome, I can't wait. Good, uh, they may end up in your Christmas stocking at some point. I was just looking at this old speed graphic. Now this camera was the workhorse of the photographic industry, especially news reporters. Um, documentators uh, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and by the time you get to the 50s, things start to uh, uh, shift over more to 35 millimeter. So one of the things I like about the speed graphic is that it's a nice weighty uh, instrument. Uh, you, when you focus, you actually look through this little eyepiece right here for focusing. And there are two windows here, so it's a lot like a range finder camera where you're not looking right through the lens which would be here but you're actually got two little windows here and you'll see a split image and as you focus and here's the focusing right here like this then the image will come together or come apart when it comes together you're in focus now you can do a more quick view by just looking through this little uh, viewfinder here and for a really quick view we'll just lift this up and it allows you to point it in the general direction of what you're taking a picture of. Well, you know, when you're taking a picture of this thing, and, and here I've, you have to cock the shutter, and here's the shutter release right here, just like that. Anyway, when you take your picture, uh, you're gonna take a picture using a sheet film. It's cut sheet film, and I happen to have here some old Tri-X film here, which they still make, believe it or not. So in total darkness, you're gonna go into the dark room and you're gonna take your sheet film and you're gonna put it into the film loader like this. And now you come out into the daylight. And when you're ready to take your picture, you're gonna open up the back of the camera, sort of like this. And you're gonna shove this guy in like that. And when you're ready to take your picture, you pull this out, you take your picture, and you put this guy back in and then you can take it out. And then if you're really smart, usually you have this on a tripod, by the way. Right, so then you flip the film over and you'll have another sheet on the other side. So you got two shots per roll. The two sides are, are separate. So you got one side here that, here. Yeah. Load this up. This is what you would do in the dark room, yes. So you got one side like this, which has got film. And then when you flip it over, you got the other side. I forgot to mention on the back of the camera, you could also, if you had a tripod and maybe a dark cloth, you could press this and then you can look through the camera right through the lens. So you can also focus and see right through the back of the camera, sort of like a traditional view camera. That's cool, but it sure seems like a lot of work. It does, but keep in mind, this is what they had back in those days. 35 millimeter was just starting to be in existence. By the way, there's several famous uh, photographers that made use of this uh, speed graphics. One that I can think of that would be very entertaining for you to research is this uh, famous photograph taken by a photographer named Sam Shear. In 1937, the aircraft uh, called a dirigible, the Hindenburg dirigible, came over to America as it was landing, and this was recorded live uh, on radio, the whole thing blew up. And Sam Shear was there with his trusty speed Graflex. And as he said, I barely had time to take two pictures. Click, click. I did it as fast as I could. I'm paraphrasing what he said. I basically shot from the waist. 
And if you look at his photograph, you'll see uh, what a magnificent image it was that caught the full glory of this dirigible being blown up as it was trying to land. Believe it or not, there are people who actually survived. So there was another famous photographer who actually was very active in the 40s and the 50s, and his name was Arthur Fiedlick. Sid Kaplan was his nephew, and Sid Kaplan comes with us every summer out to Lily, South Dakota. Laura and I take the big journey, and Sid's out there. He's probably in his 80s, maybe I'm guessing. Uh, Sid uh, by himself is a great photographer, but he was also a great printer and worked for people like Robert Frank. Anyway, Arthur Thielig was also a teacher of my father. Right after World War II, my dad took uh, a class from him in New York from Uncle Ouija, as he was known. So he had a two-way police radio in his car so he could hear all the latest murders and accidents. And he would get to the scene with his trusty speed graphic, and he would take pictures of beating out all the other reporters. He had a dark room in his apartment, and he would show up at the, uh, the newspaper later that night or early in the morning with the eight by 10 glossies that could be published. So he was somewhat of a magician. So that's why they called him Ouija the Magnificent. Another photographer who I was thinking of who used the speed graphics was a, a woman named Margaret Burke White. Now she did the very first cover for Life Magazine back in 1937. So then here it is, the Fort Peck Dam. But she's associated with her long career of Life Magazine where primarily she used the speed graphics and then later she used other cameras, but she's a early practitioner of this type of camera. But as you know, speed graphics, which somebody donated to the school is um, pretty heavy, pretty slow. You can get some good shots, but you know, when the uh, Germans first invented the little miniature 35 millimeter camera called the Leica. It was a, a camera that was handheld, used 35 millimeter movie film. This is Germany, middle 20s. And they had a big film industry, you know, back then. And they needed a quick way of looking at the lighting in the, the scene. So uh, they would take a picture using this little Leica camera. And uh, Leica then became synonymous with uh, a fine quality uh, rangefinder 35 millimeter camera that's still used today, especially during uh, the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. World War II was documented by photographers using the Leica camera. Well, the Leica camera, lightweight, uh, also a rangefinder. In other words, you didn't see through the lens. You had two little windows right here, you see. Um, Leica camera was superseded in the 1950s by a camera known as the Nikon. And so here somebody donated this to the school, or I should just say, this is an old, an old Argus. This is what my dad used right after World War II to start taking pictures of buildings so that he could make drawings of buildings. So he used the camera as kind of like a quick sketch. Anyway, in the 1950s, uh, Nikon company, also known as the Nippon Korgagu in Tokyo, created this little, uh, it was kind of an imitation of the uh, Leica and somebody donated this to us. It's very lightweight. It has uh, two mirrors that you're looking through, so it's a range finder. And it's very, very quiet. When you, when you release the shutter, you can barely hear it. Reason that the range finder is so quiet as opposed to a single lens reflex camera, which kind of has a clunk sound, is because there's no mirror in this uh, camera that go, goes flying up. When you're looking through the back of the camera, which is, See right here, you're looking through that guy right there. You're actually looking through the prism in front right here, see? And then the focusing is done here and there's a split image in there. And when the split image comes together, you're, uh, then you're uh, taking the picture, but you're not looking through the lens. And the result is when you uh, cock the shutter and then click it, it's like a whisper because the shutter just opens and closes and there's no big mirror flapping up to the top of the camera making that plunk sound. So it's very quiet, great for weddings. My dad used to have a Leica, they always use that weddings because he could take pictures and not disturb people. Now the Nikon and the Leica, they didn't have light meters. Well, of course the Speed Graphics didn't have a light meter either. So people have been donating light meters to us, which I think is kind of interesting. Here's, a, here's one here called the, the Weston master light meter. And it reads what we call 
uh, reflective light. So the light comes from the sun or from a light bulb, bounces off an object, and then the little prism in the back, see it right here, would read that light. Right now it's closed, so that would be for uh, outside. And then if you open it up like this, this would be for low level light indoors. And they worked off of what we call a selenium cell. So they lasted a long time, but these guys are kind of ancient. Uh, this, so this is the Master 5. Uh, I'm sorry, the, just the Master. And then somebody donated a Master uh, Master 2. So this is called the Weston Master 2. And when I was a kid, I had a Weston Master 5, which was the latest edition, which unfortunately I left on a rock up at Jake Cook Park so that I never saw it again. Boo-hoo. But I got other light meters since then. Now, it's called the Weston Light Meter, but it had nothing to do with Edward Weston. Uh, Edward Weston would have loved to have received the money and the royalties from the sale of these light meters. Now, another light meter that somebody gave the school, which I thought was really cool, is a Psychonic. And this is a little different because if you'll notice that it's got a little sphere here. And that's because it measures a different type of light source. It uh, measures incident light. So that's uh, measuring the light itself hits the little sphere, which is kind of like a person's face, so that you know you've got shading on one side, you've got a highlight there, so it's really nice for portrait photographers. So you've got two different types of light meters: the reflective light meters like this, and then the incident light meters like this. And for those of you who know anything about Ansel Adams, you'll realize that his entire theory of the zone system based upon reading shadows and highlights, making comparison to adjust your exposures and your development of your film is all based upon reflective light, not the incident light. But photographers still use it, especially portrait photographers, color photographers, people like that. Well, the integration of the the light meter into the camera sort of ended by the 1990s with something that looked like this. Here's a Nikon camera. It's a F100. This was the last camera that they made, the most sophisticated 35 millimeter regular film. And you're looking through the back of the camera through the lens. So it is a single lens reflex camera, not a range finder. Somebody donated this. It's pretty heavy. It, uh, it works, it's got batteries in it. Is it as heavy as that really big camera you Wait, have there? Let me just see here. <laughs> this guy's oh, heavier. <laughs> okay. But people were stronger back then, you know. Yeah, people were buff, they were in shape. Not, not like today. This also has, of course, a built-in light meter. That built-in light meter began in the 1960s or so with uh, Nikon and other cameras like that. So when you think about it, from the 1920s, the speed graphics here, up to about 1990, we're talking about, you know, almost 100 years of equipment that people have given us that we've sort of accumulated in this gathering of uh, cast-offs and little orphans that have uh, wound up in our uh, collection, soon to be jettisoned off into the outer space. So usually when we think about light, we think about sunlight, maybe artificial light, but you can't carry artificial light with you, or but can you really? Well, yes, you can. It's called a flash unit. So here are people who have given us flash units. I, mean, I just have to go get them, so just wait. Uh, here's one of a Canon camera that we hand out to students. We let them rent it for the, and they work pretty good. They're real workhorses. They're a little like those speed graphics uh, from the uh, 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. These uh, uh, Canons uh, do last a long time. Now, uh, on all the Canons, there is uh, something called a little hot shoe and it's right on top, right there. And people have donated to us these little miniature flash units because a 35 millimeter single lens reflex cameras don't often uh, have a flash unit, not like your digital cameras today that have built-in flashes. So uh, you're, this is a separate unit that you buy and you can see that uh, you turn it on here that works out of batteries. I would recommend getting good batteries rather than cheap batteries that will leak and explode inside your camera as we sometimes learn. <laughs> and I think it's come on. Well, there's a little uh, light here. I'll turn this off here. See. There's a little light here when you turn it on, the little light comes on. Does it come on? I don't know if you can see it or not. Yeah, there it is, it's on. And now the flash is ready to go. And so you can kind of test it by just going like that. And it makes a little noise. Now you can mount it right on your camera, just like this with that hot shoe. And you synchronize it with the correct shutter speed so that the um, camera and the um, shutter speed of the camera and the flash sort of talk. You know, so here we go, we just go, does it work? Oops, we gotta, gotta cock the shutter. 
Oh, we got to put it on. Go. There, it went off. I think it went off. Did it go off? Now, before you had the battery-powered flash units, they actually had cameras that had little flash units like this. I thought this is such a cute little camera. It's a, a, a brownie hawkeye. Oh, it is so cute. Yeah, they are. Is that, that one's not very heavy, is it? No, it's light as a feather, and, uh, uh, although still heavier than my cell phone. It is made by Kodak, and the brownie is one of the early cameras that they made. And this uses a roll film, not 35 millimeter, but a bigger film, 620. You get about 12 shots uh, on a roll. And it did come with a little flash unit because, you know, people often take pictures uh, in churches, in houses, and so it's awfully dark. And film back in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s was kind of slow. So good for outdoors, but not for indoors. So they made a variety of flash bulbs, and you can still buy these flash bulbs. Really? Yes, you can. You go to your flash bulbs store and pick these up. So I don't know if we can get a close up of this. Maybe we'll do a, a cutaway. But it looks like it's filled with like little filaments. It's quite pretty. Oh, it looks like you, frost. You know, if, it does. And actually, if you were drinking heavily, this would look really magnificent. But I'm not. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll I'll put this unit right in here if I can get it to work. It should. Does that work? Yeah. So, and then let's see, there's the shutter. Oh, here's the shutter. They just go kind of like this, right? Here we go. There you oh, go. That was bright. It is bright. Now, uh, it's really hot, so there's an ejector on the back. Pops it out, and I still don't touch it because it's hot. You know, if you're out on a dry day, it falls in some uh, dry leaves, you know, you could easily start a fire. Anyway, you know, there are some, I'd like to show you guys photographers that made some of this equipment famous. And I can think of two photographers right off the bat that made use of a flash in a very distinctive and unique way. One guy was O. Winston Link. I love that name, O. Winston Link. And he was a great aficionado of the old trains. So he would take, he would bring big portable flash units hooked up to these big batteries and a couple guys working with him and they'd set up these scenes at night as the train is coming by with the smoke coming out. And here's one of his famous photographs where you've got a combination of not only the train going by, but you got people sitting in their cars, this is done about the 1950s, and then you've got on the movie screen, you've got a picture of an airplane. So you've got all the means of transportation during the late 19th, early 20th century. Old Winston Lake. So it, there was a show of his a couple of years ago out at the uh, gallery and where we go on our field trip. They've got a, a, an original dark room from 150 years ago. Uh, with all the chemicals still in there, a studio, and then they got a museum in Old Winston Lake. I uh, had a show there, and I was seeing those in person. I'd seen them on, on the internet. Oh, cool. did you go to it? Part, yeah, because we, you were there, I think. You had to be there. Oh, I don't know what I was doing. Probably taking uh, pictures of you, you were taking pictures of people. Of the, of the bottles of chemicals, too. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> seeing if you could do a little mixology. <laughs> Another famous photographer made interesting use of artificial light flash was uh, Deanne Arbus. So she's a New York photographer in the 1960s, came to a great, great height. And at the top of her career, she uh, unfortunately committed suicide. But her photographs and her use of the flash on the camera was emblematic of her style because uh, her style was so unique at the time. Uh, people were uh, quite upset by her images. And now, you know, you look back and eh, they seem rather tame. So the reason she used the flash outdoors was because she was also using a very slow film, Adox KB14, that had an ASA of about 14. So, I mean, it was a real, you had to have a very bright sunny day and you're still shooting it like at a 60th of a second because you need a lot of light. And the advantage to using such a slow film, of course, it was very, very fine grain. So she could make big prints. Dan Arbus, Oh, Winston Lake, two great practitioners using flash units. And there's, there's other photographers too. You know, there is some darkroom equipment that people have given us that uh, I should just have, show you before we give it the toss. Let me get that stuff out. Before I uh, go on to darkroom equipment, I just wanted to show you this a beautiful little camera. It is actually a movie camera and it's made by Bolex and it uses eight millimeter film. After the eight millimeter came Super 8, and then uh, came video after that. But uh, this beautiful little camera made in Switzerland still works very nicely. It has two lenses, a long lens and a normal lens with adjusting apertures. You just crank it like this, you know, wind it up like so, and then you press it. Now, let's see, I'll put it near my microphone, see if we can hear it.
That's the film passing through the camera. That's kind of a reassuring sound. Sort of like a kitty purring. You should turn that into a sleep app. Yeah. The sound. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this is from the old days. You can still buy 8mm, Super 8, and 16mm. It's not cheap, but uh, you can still get it. It's called the Bolex Pallard. Very simple on the inside here. And you put your film, your 8mm film, here. And then you attach it to here. And then as it runs, let me just wind it up again. This is all mechanical, of course. No batteries. And, and then we'll... There you go. Live action. Now the dark room. Loading film, and if you don't have a dark room, can be problematic. We have tons of these black changing bags. They kind of look like... It looks like a t-shirt. It does, and I was thinking of you, Laura, because it's stylish, you know? And let me tell you why you would need this. So a long time ago, people had to develop film, and they couldn't get to a dark room. Let's say they're out in the Borrego Desert in Southern California, which in the middle of the winter is about 80, 90 degrees, but quite cold at night. So anyway, so you're out there taking pictures, and then you say, well, I'd like to see if those exposures have turned out. So then all you do is unzip it, and there's actually two bags to make it light tight. And of course, you would bring along with your equipment a canister, and then you put your uh, canister into the bag, and you take the film that you just exposed, and you put it into the bag, and then can open and stuff like that, which I don't have, and then you zip it up, zip, 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 just like that, and then you put your hand through here like this, and it's light tight, there's elastic on this, so it it holds, it goes around your wrists securely. And then you undo everything and you load up the film. A little awkward, but you could do it. It, it would work out. And then, of course, you bring your chemicals with you that you keep in the back of the car. And then once it, your film is in the light tight container, then you can develop your film on the spot while you're on location. So that is the purpose of the changing bag. And we've got boxes and boxes of these. And the question is, what should we do with them? Should we throw them away or should we repurpose them? Now, you have a really good suggestion, Laura. You thought that it looks like a shirt. You've got your arms here, so I can put this, put my hands through like this. Let's see if I'm going to get through here. Wait, this is easier said than done. get through here. Maybe you need a larger size bag t-shirt. Maybe. Ah, yeah. There we go. <laughs> There's one hand. And here's, is this the other hand here? No. Okay, it's in here somewhere. <laughs> How about here? Ah, there you go, just like that. There you go. Put it on like this, just like that. Now the only problem with this <laughs> is you're going to have to cut a little hole for your head, you see. Mm. So, but, you know, a, a good seamstress could take care of that. And then you've really got a nice little uh, jacket. It's uh, light proof. So if you're afraid of, you know, getting too much, you know, light on your chest as you walk around, this would definitely uh, block those uh, harmful rays coming in. Uh, this could also be used for, uh, it, it's uh, water repellent. So this could be used in rainstorms. And because of the black here, it'd be a great place to put uh, your logo or some sort of decoration. That's uh, the changing bag. Now, people have often been giving us these uh, ways of washing your film. Because once you're finished developing your film, you have to wash it. I kind of like this guy. Uh, they still actually make these. But there's a big tube in here. You can see like that. And you drop your, you drop your film. And this is a metal reel. Most people now use plastic. A little safer for various reasons, which I won't get into. Anyway, so you put these guys right in here like so. And you put this into your tap and the water comes through and then comes out like this. And then when it reaches the top, finally goes up, reaches the top, the water actually shoots out of the bottom. So your fix, which is heavier than the, the water, comes out of the bottom. So it's a good way to clean your film quickly and easily, you know, like in five minutes. So that's, that's one thing that people have given us. Here's another one, I love this one. This one is a quite sculptural, quite sculptural. You can see where the film goes in, and this will handle uh, 120, you know, larger, uh, uh, two and a quarter size, 35 millimeter, and just put it in like that, and you would plug it in, oh, here, plug it in through here like this, 
and the, uh, it's sort of like a hurricane. It comes roaring through and whooshes around, and then it all comes out of this tube here and out down through this, this bottom part right here. So this is kind of cool. Somebody made this. The only problem is, is that this size tubing right here is uh, a little unusual. I only tried it once and I noticed that all the plastic tubes I have were either too big or too small and wouldn't work with this. So I'd, no. have, to get a, I'd have to get a clamp, a little clamp to. It's too bad, I was hoping to see what it did. Oh, maybe that'll be another video. That would be really good. That'll be a, a real video where we just watch it go up and down water, going <laughs> in and out, in and out. Then people started to give us something called grain magnifiers. We have got a ton of these little cheap grain magnifiers. And the idea of this is when you're making an enlargement, you put this right in the middle of the projected image on your easel and you uh, slowly move the focusing knob back and forth. You can see the grain coming in and out of focus. The grain looks like a salt and pepper. You don't really see an image, you just see the grain. So these are pretty good. They work most of the time. Now somebody gave us a real fancy, expensive one. And this one here, I don't know who it's made by, but uh, much more fancy. Oh, here it is. It's called Micromega. And uh, it's a critical focuser. These retail for about 250 bucks or something like that. But Ooh. somebody gave that, yeah. So I just keep this here in case somebody really wants a nice grain magnifier. And then somebody made this one. I love this one. It's got a little mirror here and here's a focusing thing here and just allows you to, you know, get that image as the image hits here, uh, goes off the glass, goes into here and you can see it right here with your eyeball and then you can get your image nice. Have we ever, uh, have we ever tried this? Did we ever try this? See if it worked? I don't think so. But we should try it at least some point before we either throw it away or put it in a museum. Now you know what? I've got one other thing that's so cool. It's fun to repurpose things. So I happen to have this device here. This guy right here. There we go. There we go. Here is the way we used to dry prints years ago. So my dad and I had a, a little commercial thing. We were doing some prints for Cargill every month. And uh, the guy wanted eight by 10 glossies. So this is before RC paper, of course, because um, RC paper didn't come till later. You would buy F surface paper, which was, which was glossy. Uh, and that F meant ferrotype. You had the ability to uh, ferrotype it. And the ferrotyping technique used uh, this uh, plate-like thing. And you would get a print once it pops off. And I don't know if you can see, but this has a lot of shine to it. And that glossiness, people wanted that, that eight by 10 glossy. This happens to be a picture of Gary Puckett. Do you remember, I don't know, do you remember Gary Puckett and the Union Gap? I can't remember a single song he did. So here's the way we, the technique we would use. After, after we made the print, we put them in a little solution called Picosol. That was a local manufacturer here in Minneapolis. I don't know if it was nationwide. And then it was all wet and stuff. And you put it onto the, onto the plate and you kind of squeegee it. And then you would put this guy down like this and turn it on. And you wait, you know, about 10 minutes. And now all that solution would disappear and the print would become dry. And then when you lifted it up, turn it up, this guy would just pop right off and you'd have a perfect, a perfect sheen on it with an eight by 10 glossy, which all the clients wanted. Well, now you got RC paper, you got some lovely uh, surfaces that are glossy and you don't need this anymore. So I guess we just dump it. But I thought of a great idea. We could repurpose this and I thought we could we use the heat of this. One of my other favorite things is besides music and, and photography is to eat. So I thought this would be a fun thing to uh, uh, use to make some grilled cheese sandwiches. Really? Yeah, we're going to do that. So first thing I'll do is I'll put it over here on the wall and I'll plug it in. We'll turn it on. And now let me get my ingredients. I'll just, I'll be right back. I'll get my ingredients here. So I have here some of my uh, locally favorite bread, Sara Lee Artisano bread. And I've got, some, I like sharp cheddar cheese. So I'll put that right there. And we got some bread here, just like this. And I'll put that like that. And take out some nice cheese. And I'm kind of going on a diet. So I'm just going to use one piece right there like that. There we go. Normally I'd have about two or three. And we'll just put it like that, like this. And we'll go over here. Now we gotta go, this has to get a little warmer, okay. You know, 
there's a, a movement now, which I fully agree with, for people who are uh, leaning towards more vegetarianism. And then uh, if you go even further, then you've gone into the world of veganism, uh, which is uh, non-dairy. And there is some delightful cheeses out there that are non-dairy, they're based upon soy. And there are some good cheeses that will melt very nicely. And that and chow is the name of one, C-H-A-O, chow. So that can be used also for a grilled cheese. And there's various uh, substitute butter sources also made from soy that are very nutritious and not based upon uh, animal uh, usage. I think we've got to put up enough heat here, just like that. So we're going to take this like that, and we'll put it in here just like this, like that, put it right there, and we'll put the lid down. And now, time. I'll get my cell phone, and we'll time it for a few minutes, and then we'll flip it over, okay? Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. I'm not sure about this. Okay, that's probably long enough for one side. Let's just flip it over. Oh, just like that. Yeah. Oh, that looks pretty good. I can't believe it toasted that bread. Yeah. It's... Boy, that's a good use for it. It is. And I could probably put about four or five separate grilled cheese sandwiches. So it's, it makes a lot at one time. So when you're having a big grilled cheese sandwich uh, a party. <laughs> uh, Which I don't do very often. No, but... Yeah, I think that'd be kind of a, yeah, hmm. pull people together and maybe play a rollicking game of Monopoly or something. Yeah, wow. <laughs> well, let's flip it over and see if the cheese has melted and both sides are nice and brown. And so I think I'll unplug the whole thing, bring it over here, like this. There we go, lift it up. Ah, look at that, Ooh. both sides, look at that, Ooh. very nice. Mm. Well, you're not gonna get a better cheese sandwich, melted cheese sandwich than this nice, this is real cheese, so it's, it's really good. So we've repurposed then the old ferrotype heater. Looks like Laura's got her job ahead of her with the uh, changing bags. And uh, yeah, the rest of it, I guess, let it go. Listen, we'll see you soon. And Laura, we're signing off for today. Bye-bye now.